What we're going to do uh, today is talk about, well, we're, we're going to review a couple of concepts, and that is acceleration. What is acceleration? What is the definition for acceleration? Then we're going to apply that definition for acceleration um, in a new way. We're going to talk about, we're going to define a thing called centripetal acceleration. You know, what is centripetal acceleration? We're going to use that to talk about centripetal force. And then we'll talk about uh, a couple of applications for centripetal force. Um, two examples um, of applications of this. So that's what we're going to try and do today. Okay, so first let's talk about acceleration. Um, suppose that you are, uh, so let's talk about acceleration. And this is reviewing uh, way back. Suppose you're at a stoplight. Here's your car. Uh, your initial velocity is zero. The light turns green. And what do you do? Push, push your foot on the gra on the on the grass on the gas. Put your foot on the gas, and you accelerate forward, right? So we have an acceleration to the right. Now, if you if you do this really, uh, if you really put the pedal to the metal, so to speak, do you you feel this acceleration, don't you? What do you feel? No. What do you physically feel as if is happening to you? Hmm? Well, if you're if, if I'm in a car that's accelerating forward really fast, what do I feel like? I feel like I'm getting pushed back in my seat, right? You you feel this sudden you know this whoosh to the, um, this backwards push on you, but that's not what's happening. I mean that's what you feel, but what's actually happening is that your seat is pushing you forward. It's accelerating your mass forward along with the rest of the car. But it feels like you're getting pushed backwards. So even though your acceleration is forward, you feel as if you're getting pushed back. And I'm going to put this, this is what you feel. You feel a backwards um, force on your body even though you're accelerating forward. So what you feel is in the opposite direction of what's actually happening to you, right? Now suppose you get up to speed. So here's your car, okay, and you're really going fast, okay, and then you notice there's a little kitty cat. Well, I guess everything is, is relative. You, you notice a little kitty cat. Now, some of you may actually hit, uh, continue to accelerate forward. <laughs> However, uh, I, feeling sorry for the little kitty, and actually if the kitty's this big, I'm going to break for my own personal safety. <laughs> I'm going to break. Now that's going to slow my acceleration down. So what's the direction of the acceleration here? <coughs> I'm going to accelerate backwards, right? Uh, against my direction of motion and that's going to slow me down see my velocity is forward but if I hit the brakes my acceleration is going to be in the opposite direction I'm going to slow down but what do I feel if I'm sitting in that car and you slam on the brakes you feel like you're being what <coughs> thrown forward don't you you feel like you're being thrown forward but that's not what's happening what's happening is that your seat belts or the windshield or whatever is pushing uh, backwards on you to slow your mass down. You have inertia and you need to slow down. And to slow down, you need a backwards force on you. Um, but you feel as if you're being thrown forward. So, and we also said that this acceleration, we defined it to be a change in velocity over a change in time. Whoops. That's how we defined acceleration. 
Well, now we're going to take a look at a different situation. So let's say you're in this same car. You're in the same car, and it's late at night. You miss the cat. It's late at night, and you see a big, empty parking lot. And you think, perfect opportunity to put down a donut. Yeah. All right. Now, unfortunately, I drive a car that looks very similar to the drawing here. It's a 2001 Toyota Prius. Uh, and... Uh, so putting a donut down is very difficult, but I can at least drive in circles, right? So now it's pretty hard to show myself uh, drawing, you know, going in circles. So let's say there's, a, unbeknownst to me, there's a police helicopter watching my every move. And um, so soon I'm gonna get a ticket, but I'm in the parking lot and I'm trying to put down a donut. So here's my path. <coughs> And I'm just driving in circles, and so I'm, here's my car, as seen by the helicopter, and my velocity is like this, right? That's my velocity vector. But I'm not going to change my speed. I'm not slowing down or speeding up. I'm just driving in a very tight little circle. But you've done this before. What do you feel? If you go around a turn, if I'm a passenger in this car, what do I feel? Gravity. Okay, you feel gravity. But don't you feel like you're gonna, if, like if, if somebody were to open, like let's say you're a passenger and you're not wearing your seatbelt and someone takes a very sharp left turn or maybe it's just going in a left, circ, left turning circle, going really fast and then, and then the car, then the door swings open, what happens to you? Ah! All right. So you feel as if you're getting pushed outward, don't you? If the car is going around like this, you feel, this is what you feel, okay? But that's not what's actually happening. You feel acceleration. Here you, you felt an acceleration. This is the acceleration. You, you feel like you're being thrown forward even though the acceleration is in the opposite direction of your motion to slow you down. Uh, when you were here, you were accelerating forward, but you felt as if you were getting pushed back. Here, you feel as if you're sliding out the side of your car, right? You've all experienced this. Because what's actually happening is you have an acceleration like this. There is an acceleration on the car. And it's in the opposite direction of what you feel. When you are driving today, I want you to notice this. Now, be safe and don't put a donut down in some parking lot. I'm not advocating that. But I do want you, you know, when you go around a turn, to feel this acceleration. It feels as if you're trying to slide out the car this way. But what's actually happening is that your car is pushing on you towards the center of the circle that you're making the turnaround. And this acceleration towards the center of the circle is called centripetal acceleration. Now, we said that acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time. What am I changing about the velocity when I accelerate forward? I'm increasing my speed, aren't I? I'm increasing how fast the velocity is. When I brake, I'm decreasing my speed, right? I'm, I'm decreasing the magnitude of my velocity vector. But here, when I'm going around in a circle, I'm not changing my speed but I am changing something about my velocity. What's being changed about my velocity when I move in a circle at a constant speed? 
the direction. Centripetal acceleration, it changes the direction of the velocity vector. Now remember that we said a vector has a both, what did I do there? A vector has both a magnitude and a direction. The accelerations that we've dealt with so far are accelerations that change my speed. Although it could change your direction, right? The acceleration of gravity, when you throw a ball straight up in the air, the ball's going up, and then for an instant in time it stops, and then it starts coming down. So that's a change in direction as well. But it is really, what's happening is it's changing your speed. But a centripetal acceleration is an acceleration that doesn't change your speed, but it does change the direction you're going in. And it's hard to change your direction. You have to apply a force to change your direction. And um, for example, if you're, if you're um, um, walking on a very slick road and you're walking fairly fast and then you try to change your direction, you can slip. If you're driving a car and you try to take a turn too fast, you can skid off the road because it takes a force to change your direction. That force that causes a centripetal acceleration is called a centripetal force. Now, I think you've all experienced uh, this, that what if I increased my speed? What am I going to feel if I keep going around that same circle? What if I take a, a fairly sharp turn at a very high speed? I feel a very strong force that's trying to throw me out of the car, right? So that means that my centripetal acceleration is much greater. So I, I think you can see that the faster I go, the greater the centripetal acceleration as I go around that turn. Yes? Also, um, what if I'm going um, 60 miles an hour, but I take a nice gradual turn? That is the radius of the turn. Here's the radius of the circle. What if the radius of the circle is really big? then you're not going to feel much centripetal acceleration. But what if it's a really sharp turn and you try to take that at 60 miles an hour? You're in trouble. So the bigger the radius, the less centripetal acceleration I have. The, great, um, the smaller the radius, the greater the centripetal acceleration I'm going to have for the same speed. So that's an inverse relationship. So what we want to know is, What's the relationship between my speed and the radius of my turn with uh, my centripetal acceleration? And that's what we're going to derive right now. I'm not going to expect you to memorize this derivation, but I do expect you to memorize the results of this derivation. So let's uh, derive an expression for centripetal acceleration. Let's say you're moving in a circle. So here's something moving in a circle. And it's uniform circular motion. Now what do we mean by uniform circular motion? Well, we're, we're going to look at a very simple situation. Your speed is constant and the radius of the circle is constant during the time interval we're looking at. So here's my radius R and here's my object. It could be a car moving in a circle. It could be the moon moving around the earth. It could be a rock on a string that you're circling around your head. Here's my velocity. Now, if it's uniform circular motion, then if you look at it a short time later, the object is located here, so we're in a different place. Now, the length of the radius is the same, though, and we've rotated through an angle of theta. Uh, but my speed is now like this. It's the same. Let me, let me redraw this. My speed, or my velocity, is actually coming off like this. 
Now, oh, that's terrible. But um, the length of this is the same. So I haven't changed my speed, but the direction has changed. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw little triangles and I'm going to use a little geometry here. I'm going to draw my first R and my second R. And these are the same, aren't they? These R's. This R is the same as this R. Now, but R did change in direction. We went from this direction to this direction, so I, cha well, I changed it by this much. There's my delta R. And here's my angle theta. But look at my velocities now. My velocity, there's my initial velocity. And then here's my final velocity. It's right here. I'm going to pick it up and stick it right here. So I just picked this vector, velocity vector up off the paper and put it right here. Now it's the same velocity as this one. It's the same speed anyway, but it's pointed in a different direction now. Everybody with me? But here's what I want you to see. This velocity vector, if I were to pick this up, put it right here, and then rotate it, it gets rotated by the same angle as my r vector got rotated. So this is like that. This theta is the same as this theta right here. Now, my this is my initial and this is my final velocity, so I changed my velocity by this much. Now this delta r didn't change the magnitude of my radius of my circle. It just changed where my radius is pointed. And the same thing is true here. This delta v, it didn't change how fast I'm going. It just changed the direction of it. Now what kind of triangle do you call it when the two legs are the same length? There's a name for that. Isosceles. And so we have two isosceles triangle with the same angle at their vertex, which means these other angles are the same as well. What do we call two triangles that have the same angles? They are similar. So similar triangles are proportional to each other. So watch this derivation. I'm going to say delta R is to R as what? Delta V is to V. Now this is a derivation, okay? So I, I mean some smart person figured this out hundreds of years ago. I'm just <laughs> explaining it to you. Now, okay, well, this is to this as this is to this. That makes sense. Now I'm going to do something that might not make sense, but it's legal because the rules of algebra say that as long as I do something to this side, if I do the same thing to this side, it's still equal. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide both sides by delta t. Why? Because I can. And it's going to lead me to the answer. I'm going to rearrange this a little bit, use that commutative property of multiplication. I'm going to say that this is equal to 1 over r times delta r over delta t equals 1 over v times delta v over delta t. Now I'm going to use a little mathematical trick here that many of you are not yet familiar with because you haven't had AMA yet or maybe you're in AMA but uh, it's coming up next semester or you're in AM. Some of you are in calculus, though, so this will make sense to you, or hopefully it does. I'm going to do something that's called a limit. And if you haven't heard of this, don't worry about it. You will later on. I'm going to take the limit as delta t goes to 0 of this whole expression here. Now, what happens when you do this, this delta r over delta t? Well, if you say delta t is very, very tiny, then my change in angle is very tiny. Uh, my change in r is very, very tiny. But what, here's what I get. This is my change in position. This is my change in time. 
the change in position over the change in time is my velocity. So delta r over delta t becomes v. Now on this side, what is delta v over delta t? You know that one. Oh, let's take a look. Delta v over delta, my change in velocity over change in time, that's my acceleration. All right. So this is my acceleration. When I solve for acceleration here, I get the equation I want. Acceleration is equal to v squared over r. This is my centripetal, a sub c, acceleration. This is the equation that tells me what the acceleration is because I'm changing the direction of my velocity vector. This is the acceleration you feel when you go around a turn at a constant speed. Now, if you go around a turn and you hit the gas, you will have two kinds of acceleration. You will have an acceleration that will increase your speed and an acceleration that will change your direction. If you take AP <coughs> physics next year, we deal with those problems. We don't deal with them in here. But AP physics, it's a good class, so I hope some of you consider taking it next year. But um, anyway, this tells me the, and by the way, look, look, this makes a lot of sense. If you go around a turn at high speed, look, look what happens to your acceleration. What if I go twice as fast as I should? The acceleration, what is twice as fast squared? It's four times the acceleration. When you drive up to Shaver Lake, you, you know that hairpin turn? And it says 20 miles an hour, it's the speed limit. By golly, you better drive 20 miles an hour around that higher speed turn. If you try going 40 miles per hour, that's going to require four times the centripetal acceleration, which means it's four times the centripetal uh, force, which may exceed the maximum static friction between your wheels and the road, and off the road you will skid. So it really matters when you're going around a turn how fast you're going. You ever notice that when people need to make a, a right turn, sometimes they'll turn left a little bit before they turn right so that all, this, all the junk on their dashboard doesn't slide off their dashboard? I don't know, have you ever done that? Why are you turning left a little bit before you turn right? To increase the radius of your turn. If you make the radius bigger, the centripetal acceleration will be smaller because you're dividing by a bigger number and thus the stuff on your dashboard might stay where it is, you know, or your drink won't spill or whatever it is that you're doing in the car that you shouldn't be doing while you're driving. Um, but it reduces the centripetal acceleration. Now, to find the centripetal force, that is the force that makes you go in a circle, the centripetal force, all you have to do is multiply the centripetal acceleration by the mass. mv squared over r. This is the force that applies to, your, to you when you go around a turn that keeps you going in that turn. Okay. Now if you're going straight at a constant speed, you don't feel anything. But when you turn, really sharply, you're going to feel a great deal of centripetal force acting on you to change the direction of your velocity vector over time. When you change the velocity over time, that's an acceleration. Even though this acceleration doesn't change your speed, it is changing your velocity by changing your direction. Okay, let's take a look at a, a, a couple of situations where you might have uh, a centripetal force. There are two main situations I'm going to show you right now. 
So these are the applications I was talking about. What if you have a, um, a mass on a string? And let's ignore gravity right now. I want to keep it very simple. Suppose you've got, so you can do this on the space station and not worry about gravity, but you could do it right here and it would be a pretty good approximation. If I'm whirling a mass in a circle, let's say it's like a rubber stopper or something. I have one. I'm going to show you this here in a minute. Here's a rubber stopper and I've got a string. And this is moving in a very fast, so there's R, here's my string. And this is moving in a circle. You're going to feel a tension force, aren't you? If you're holding this with your hand, you're holding this string right here and it's moving in this circle, you're going to feel a tension force. There's a tension force. And that tension force is the force that's making this mass go in a circle. The tension force is pulling on the rubber stopper towards the center of the circle and making it go in a circle. If you release the string, the, the thing will just fly off. It won't continue moving in a circle. You need a force to change the velocity of an object, even if all you're changing is the direction. The other application I want to talk about briefly, here's our circle, we're looking at it, you know, kind of edge on, is your car. Well, let's take a look at your car. Gravity's trying to pull your car straight down. Let's say this is a, like a flat road like this. There's a normal force that's supporting the weight, but if you're moving in a circle, you need a force of friction between your wheels and the road that will make you go in a circle. When you go around a turn in your car, it's the force of friction, static friction between your tires and the road that's making you go in a circle. And so we will work on uh, solve problems involving this free body diagram of a car moving in a circle and this free body diagram of a mass on a string. Okay, that's it for today.